Lizzie Borden, page 130, after flea bites. Fleas was a peculiar euphemism, possibly unique to River Fall River for a woman's menstrual period. There was nothing on her blue skirt or waist, nothing on her shoes or stockings, nothing on the cover from the dining room lounge. It was bewildering. At last, Wood had compared the hair samples from Mr. and Miss Borden with the hair found on the hatchet. The hair taken from the hatchet was about one inch long and under the microscope was seen to have a red brown color and contained both the root and the point. In other words, it was hair like that from a cow or an animal and was not human hair. A tremor went through the listening crowd. Shocked newspaper men dropped their pencils. No poison, no blood, not even as much as a hair. Only one portion of Professor Wood's testimony proved troublesome for Lizzie Borden's case. By examining the contents of the Borden's stomachs, Woods estimated that at the time of the murder, Mr. Borden's digestion had been in process for three and a half to four and a half hours. Miss Borden's stomach, however, had likely been churning her breakfast for only two to three hours. Given that the two had eaten the same breakfast at the same time, Woods' observation strongly suggested that Miss Borden had died first, possibly as much as two hours before her husband. Abby Borden had last been seen alive at nine o'clock, ruling out a two and a half hour difference. Wood's testimony allowed the authority to target a 90 minute window for Miss Borden's death, somewhere between nine o'clock and 10.30 by calculating all the varying scenarios such as working backward from the discovery of Mr. Borden's body or forward from breakfast. The timing fed perfectly within both Bridget and Uncle Morse's recollection of the morning of August 4th. Wood's conclusion also aligned with the time of death. Medical examiner Dolan had deduced based on the body's differing temperatures and coagulation of blood. Experts and lay witnesses agreed. Between 9 o'clock and 10.30, someone had murdered Abby Borden. By her own admission, Lizzie Borden had been in the house the entire time. God grant your honor wisdom to decide. On Thursday, September 1st, day 7, Lizzie came into court as she always did on the arm of Reverend Buck. But this time was different. One look at her eyes told everything. Lizzie Borden had been crying, and anyone could guess the reason why. Today, Judge Blaisdell would decide whether to send her home to Second Street or return her to Totten Jail. All the testimony was in. Even her inquest testimony had been read into the official record. Only the attorney's closing arguments remained. The audience on this most pivotal day was especially lively. Most of the area's lawyers had taken the day off to hear the arguments. The woman had brought boxes of candy and crimped their children's hair and chattered as though they were waiting to watch a matinee. Lawyer Jennings stepped forward first. Carefully, he laid out the timing of Miss Borden's errands in town. His arrival home and the subsequent sounds of the alarm barely 30 minutes later. Suddenly, Jennings shouted, Lizzie Borden did not do this crime. It was the work of an insane man or of a person whose heart was black as hell itself. Every reporter in the room noticed Lizzie Borden's reaction. Her form was convulsed. Every reporter of the Globe remembered. Her lips were trembling, and she shaded her eyes with her hands in order to partially conceal the tears, which were freely, freely flowing. Those terrible bone-crushing wounds, Jennings continued, spoke for themselves. Every blow was distinct and parallel, the work of a strong and experienced hand, yet the weapon had not been found, and the motive remained unaccounted for. Evidently, the evening standard observed Mr. Jennings' feelings in his innermost conscience, the weight which was pressing on his client. It was impossible to miss. Jennings placed and shouted as he drove each point home. His plea fueled by a passionate energy, he paused only to refresh himself with a sip of ice, water, or a nip from a stick of licorice. Knowlton, meanwhile, sat at his desk with the morning papers, as though nothing of the least interest were going on. The house and barn had been burglared on three separate occasions, Jennings said, proving that someone could get on and off the property undetected, and there was the matter of strangers seen lurking about the place. Why have not the police found these suspicious-looking characters? characters outside the house, Jennings demanded, pointing to Marshall Hilliard and District Attorney Knowlton. Why? Because they have made up their minds the murderer was inside and are not looking outside. That brings it down to Lizzie and Bridget. And who would be more likely to murder a man, Jennings pondered aloud, his servant or his young do youngest daughter, the woman who swept up after him or the pet of a family, the one whose fingers were last clasped by the dead father and the one whose head last rested against his breast. Again, Lizzie comes posure crumbled. Jennings himself was almost in tears. Understand me, I don't believe that Bridget Sullivan did that deed any more than I believe Lizzie Borden did it, Jennings assured the court. His point was only that from the outset, Bridget had been treated with less 
far less suspicion than Lizzie. Was Bridget Sullivan compelled to tell how many dishes she washed, where she put them, and how she laid them away, he asked. Here is Lizzie Borden, he continued, who has been talking, taking prescriptions to cause her to sleep, and because she cannot tell the minutest details, she is supposed to be the guilty party. At last, he cried, I demand her release. Don't, your honor, when they don't show an incriminating circumstance, don't put the stigma of guilt upon this woman, reared as she has been, and with a past character beyond reproach. Don't let it go on out in the world as the decision of just, a just judge that she is probably guilty. God grant your honor wisdom to decide. The room was awash. Colonel Adam wept right along with Lizzie's friends. The mayor and the medical examiner stepped forward to shake Jennings' hand at a f first a timid pattering, and then a thunder of applause broke over the room. It was an almost impossible act for Knowlton to follow. Not only was there no direct evidence, not one tangible link between Lizzie and the crime, but Jennings' emotional plea had forced the district attorney to take on the role of a villain to do his duty as prosecutor. Where Jennings had struck hotly with emotion, Knowlton turned his aim toward cool, impartial logic. Hands in his pockets, he spoke in a most impassive manner. The district attorney also had a singular advantage. All he had to do was make Lizzie Borden appear probably guilty, proving it beyond a reasonable doubt could wait until the trial. He began with his own assessment of the wounds. They are not so such blows as a strong man would strike, Knowlton contended, but those of a weak, irresolent, and perfect feminine hand, not striking to kill the first time, but striking and striking and striking until death was apparent. Who would be benefited by this murder, Knowlton asked. That led him to an unpleasant fact. Lizzie Borden had renounced the name of mother from the only mother she had ever known. It did not seem cause enough for murder, Knowlton acknowledged, but the stubborn fact remained that Lizzie was the only person in the world with whom Miss Borden had any discord. Unfamiliar people were indeed seen outside the house, not, but not, Knowlton emphasized, entering or leaving it. Further, the defense had provided no explanation for how anyone could have gotten into the house so thoroughly locked up, both inside and out. It only stood to reason that those inside were immediately suspected. Next comes the servant girl. Now, I am a lover of fair play, and in my eyes, one class of people is no different from another, Knowlton said. Let us assume that Bridget Sullivan told all the truth he proposed. Both times, Bridget had left Lizzie alone with one of her parents, first at 9.30 to wash windows, and then at 10.55 to go nap. One of them has ended up dead. As for Lizzie's story of idling in the barn while someone chopped up her father, too convenient as far as Knowlton was concerned. She could have but one alibi, he said. There was only one place on the border property where she could not see someone leaving the house, Knowlton pointed out, making it clear that he believed Lizzie had deliberately chosen the barn for her cover story. And of course, there was a matter of Lizzie's implacable reserve. While everyone is dazed, there is but one person who throughout the whole business has not been seen to express emotion, Knowlton claimed, in bald contradiction of Lizzie's most recent burst of cheerfulness. As much as her coolness and had disturbed Officer Harrington and Assistant Marshal Fleet, Knowlton had found a way to make Lizzie's behavior both incriminating and unexpectedly reassuring. Better for a murderer to be outwardly cool and cunning than disguised behind a delicate feminine veneer. This somewhat removes... From our minds, the horror of the thing, he said. It was an inspired approach, reluctant as most people were to suspect a woman of such a crime. No one wanted to contemplate the more terrifying possibility that their own sweet-tempered daughters might be capable of murder. If Judge Blaisdell sided with the earnest, passionate Jennings and the clamor of spontaneous applause his argument had sparked, Knowlton said, we would all be proud of it and would be pleased to hear him say, we will let this woman go, but that would be a temporary satisfaction, Knowlton concluded. We are constrained to find that she has been dealing in poisonous things, that her story is absurd, and that hers and hers alone has been the opportunity for the commission of the crime. Yielding to clamor is not to be compared to that only in greatest satisfaction, that of a duty well done, deathly silent. There's only one thing to do. There was no lively chatter now, no rustling of peppermint wrappers, only Judge Blasdale's voice, husky and indistinct, as though he did not want to hear his own words. The long examination is now concluded, he said, and there remains but for the magistrate to perform what he believes to be his duty. It would be pleasure for him, and he would doubtless receive much sympathy if... 
He could say, Lizzie, I judge you probably not guilty. You may go home, but sympathy must be laid aside in view of the evidence. Lesdell continued, imagine a man standing before the court under the same circumstances, offering the same alibi he proposed. There would be no question as to what should be done with such a man. So there is only one thing to do, painful as it may be, just Lesdell paused, turning aside to wipe his cheek. The judgment of the court is that you are probably guilty, he said, and you are ordered committed to await the action of the superior court. A sound rose from the spectator, something between an excited hum and a groan. Lizzie Borden sat stone still. Stunned or indifferent, no one could tell. It was as though the news had not penetrated her. Her lower lip slid silently into her mouth. Lizzie A. Borden, stand up, clerk leaner commanded, but Lizzie could not. Her whole body was shaking now. Reverend Buck and Lawyer Jennings rushed to help her. As soon as she was on her feet, the trembling ceased. Don't be afraid, she told Reverend Buck, motioning for him to release her arm. I am all right. The judgment of this court is that you are probably guilty of the offense charged against you, Clerk Leonard read, and it is therefore the order of this court that you be committed to the tent and jail, there to await the action of the grand jury which meets the first Monday of November next. Lizzie sank wearily into her seat. Reverend Buck leaned over to console her, but Lizzie interrupted. It is for the best, I think. It is better that I should get my exoneration in a higher court, for then it will be complete. Nevertheless, Lizzie Borden wept as she was led away to the matron's room.